to buy or not to buy a property on shared ownership? That's the question that I'm going to be tackling today um, and just going through the pros and cons uh, from my own personal perspective because I've actually been through the process myself and hopefully it gives you a clearer idea on if this is something you want to do for yourself. Okay, so pro number one is pretty obvious. It gives you access onto the housing ladder. Because with shared ownership, you are only buying a percentage of the total property. You therefore only need to raise a percentage of the deposit, which means that you have a lot less time to save. You don't have to save for as long to get your deposit money together. So it's a great feeling. You know, we all just love that feeling of like owning something and being able to paint it the way you like and, you know, practice your DIY skills. Um, it really kind of counts for a lot. So the second one is stability as well. So if you've been in rented accommodation, um, we all know that, you know, landlords can give you notice uh, at any point if they want their property back and you therefore have to move on to the next place. So with shared ownership, once you've bought your percentage, uh, you can stay there for as long as you like. So if you want to establish yourself in an area, you want to raise children in an area, um, you just really like an area and you like the place, that's a great way to kind of set yourself stably without having to worry about someone moving you on. Okay, and uh, pro number three is capital growth. Um, that 50% that you've bought, 50% is an example, you can buy shared ownership in many different types of percentages, but we'll take 50% as an example in this video throughout because it's easy. Okay, 50%, if you purchase that 50% and let's say for argument's sake, the house is worth £100,000 when you buy it, your 50% is worth £50,000. Over time, mm -hmm. if the house goes up in value by a hundred grand, mm -hmm. let's say, um, your 50%, mm -hmm. which was worth 50,000 pounds, will now be worth a hundred thousand mm -hmm. pounds. And that capital growth is something that you would actually benefit from. So it would be entirely yours um, and obviously based on the equity that you actually have for that portion of the house. So it's a really great benefit. It means that you see growth on money that you haven't necessarily put in. Um, so that is a, something really worth considering if you're in areas that have a housing market that grows. Some areas, you know, the houses pretty much stay the same price year on year for, for years on end. So, you know, that might not be a consideration if you live in a part of the country that doesn't have that. But if you live in a part of the country where, you know, houses year on year tend to grow, you know, almost double in price every 10 years, then it's, it's definitely worth considering as a plus. Okay, now on to the cons. Con number one, um, you are only buying a percentage of the property. So what happens with the other percent? You will have to pay rent on it, just like if you were renting anywhere else. And just like where you're renting anywhere else, the landlord can put the rent up. So when you're doing your calculations for affordability, make sure you consider the fact that Whatever you're accounting for, you've got your mortgage payment. If you're buying your percentage on mortgage, the remaining amount you have to pay rent on. And that rent, it might be 300 when you start, but next year it might be 350, might be 400. You have to account for the fact that that can change over the future. And also, other costs involved like ground rent and maintenance. These are also costs that are outside of our control. So we have to kind of account for that over the long term. If ground rent goes up, if maintenance charges go up, can we still actually afford, you know, only owning 50% of that house and paying out that amount of money. And the costs sometimes are even more for a property that has concierge and all of those things. Uh, you know, often it means that the maintenance charge to maintain concierge and the gym and all of that jazz costs money. And it's gonna have to come from the people who actually own the flat. Even if you only own a percentage, you will pay a percentage of those costs. Okay, and there's other things as well, like um, where we used to be, uh, you know, bulk waste. Sometimes people would leave a sofa out there for bulk waste and not call the council to come and collect it. And it meant that, you know, the managing company would clear that, but they would add that cost to our, you know, maintenance charge every month. So for the next couple of months, it would go up by 20 or 30 pounds to account for that cost and then come back down to the normal rate. Um, so these are all things kind of worth considering. Okay, so con number two, because you don't own 100% of the house, you actually need to ask for permission before doing any major work. You know, redoing the kitchen, the bathroom, any of that jazz, you can do it, but you need to request permission first. Just like if you were living with a partner, you know, you wouldn't just go and redo the bathroom without telling them, right? Well, 
No, hopefully not. So in the same way, you actually need to request permission from the managing company um, to actually carry out any work. And there's two reasons why you do it. The very first reason is obviously just to notify them because they own the other half. But the second reason is quite important to actually keep a record once you've gotten the permission of anything that you do. So we redid uh, the bathroom. We spent about 5,000 pounds on that. We added in some fitted wardrobes in one of the bedrooms. We redid the kitchen and stuff. Um, we kept every single receipt for the work that we did. And why this was important was that when we got to the point where we wanted to buy the remaining percent of the house, where we wanted to staircase to 100 100 percent and the surveyor came in and he calculated the value of the property based at market value for that time and then we said to him look this is the value that we've added to the house and so he looked at it and it's and, and he actually accounted for that so he subtracted that from the amount that we owed you know to purchase the remaining half now it's not a straightforward subtraction. He didn't just say, well, you spent 5,000, so I'm gonna subtract 5,000 pounds from the amount left that you need to pay. It wasn't as straightforward as that. The surveyor takes a view on how much value he thinks you've added from the improvements that you've done, but you will get a discount from the price that you need to pay for the remaining amount of percentage when it comes time for you to staircase. So all really important documents to kind of keep in, just keep good record keeping okay and con number three is uh, think about your exit strategy now what do i mean by this if you decided to buy the house on shared ownership you bought 50 percent of the house and then a couple of years down the line you decide you know what i want to move this isn't for me or your life circumstances have changed you know you you just want to move how do you do it you know there's a couple of things to consider sometimes uh with shared ownership, you often have to give first refusal to the managing company or the, the main owners of the other half, uh, which means that you need to give them the first option to buy you know, your percentage of the house. So they have a little bit of time where they're allowed to market it at their price and see if they can get it sold, which means that you can't sell it as quick because once they've had their chance to do it, you then can put it out to the open market to sell. And for one reason or the other, often uh, shared ownership houses are a bit slower to sell than ones that are on 100% ownership, particularly if they're not brand new. So it's certainly something to consider when it comes time to sell, it might be a lot harder to actually get rid of. And especially if you're not planning to be there long term. Okay, the second uh, thing to consider is obviously you know, if you decide to staircase to 100%, there's additional costs um, you know, all of the surveying fees and, you know, all of the, you know, conveyancing and all of that jazz you have to pay for again. Now, I don't particularly think this is a deal breaker because, you know, for any property that we've ever owned, we've always remortgaged it over the life of the property. And that's cost that you have to pay anyway when you remortgage. So I actually don't think that's a deal breaker. But for some people, it actually comes into account. And that's why I mention it. The other thing to consider is when do you actually want to staircase to 100%? Is that something that you want to do? If it is, when do you plan to do it? Because if you're buying the house now, interest rates are super duper low, right? Which means that that mortgage cost might look really affordable, you know, when you calculate it with all the other costs that you have to pay. But in, you know, five years time, when you think, well, right, well I want to staircase in five years time, mortgage uh, interest rates could have shot through the roof and then remortgaging onto that or moving to staircase to purchase the whole property on that might be a lot more difficult so you really want to think about in the long term is this something that i would be able to afford to do will i still be working will i still be in employment um, and the reason why it's so important to think about this is because you don't want to end up trapped if you can't sell it and you can't staircase to 100 percent, you can't move you cannot, one of the key things with a lot of shared ownership properties is you absolutely cannot rent it out if you don't own it 100%. So you can't say, right, well, in the future, I'll just move and rent it out until I can get it sold. Can't do it, not allowed, right? So you have to think about the end game. You know, when you want to get out, is it going to be something that's possible for you? And another key consideration is age. You know, if you're younger, then um, you've got more years to kind of be on the working um, ladder and maybe improving your salary as you go along. So your prospects are hopefully getting better over time. Um, but there's a threshold um, where it's kind of, you have to really think about when you want to staircase. If you're in your 40s and you're buying it now and you plan to only stay 
your case in about 10 years time, it means that you will only be getting mortgage products um, for people in their 50s in 10 years time. And those can be a lot more restrictive because obviously mortgage terms are calculated on, you know, the date that we think the date that they think you're going to retire or we think we're going to retire. Um, so, you know, the the term, the mortgage terms you're able to get might be a lot more restrictive and the payments a lot higher, which might leave you feeling quite trapped and not able to move. So these are all kind of things to consider because you don't want to find out many, many years down the line when you've bought it that you can't sell it. Or if you sell it, you're not going to have enough money to actually be able to purchase another house in full. Um, so you really want to think about the end. You don't want to feel trapped. You know, it can cause breakdown in relationships. It can cause, you know, mental health misery, really, um, the feeling of being trapped. So the excitement of getting your foot on the ladder and all of that is is all well and good, but it's not worth it if in the long term it's not going to be something that brings you joy. OK, and, um, you know, last but not least, uh, did I have any other one? I feel like I had another point. Okay, and... Yeah, actually, there was one other one. Don't buy a house that at full value is overpriced because even if you're buying 50% of it, you are still paying too much for it. So make sure that the full value of the house is something that you would happily pay if you had the deposit money now, you know? And if it's not something that you'd be happy to pay, don't do it for the 50%. OK, so that's it from me today. I mean, I think there's other alternatives out there like help to buy. But, you know, you have to be careful about that. And again, always think exit strategy. Always think, you know, if I can't, you know, with help to buy, pay off the money back. You know, what does that mean in the long term? So there's other options out there and don't rush to do it just to be on the ladder if it if the numbers don't stack and it doesn't work for you. Um, and that's it for me today. I'm Mumbai from the Inspired Baobab. I talk about saving, my journey in investing and um, all things money, really. I just like talking about money. And yeah, so uh, if you're interested in any of that, um, please feel free to click the like button, click subscribe, um, and I will be posting more videos in the future. So um, have a good day. Bye bye.